Welcome to Ghostly. Are seances real? Ghostly is a podcast that comes out every other week. In each episode, we take a ghost story or paranormal event and look into its complete history. Rebecca then gives us evidence proving that the story is real. And my job is to debate those pieces of evidence and get you, the listener, prepared to vote on if it's real or not. If you haven't yet, please hit that subscribe button. And as always, we are your host. I'm Pat. And I'm Rebecca. <laughs> What's been going on, Rebecca? Well, uh, we had our very first ghostly book club. We did. We did right before Halloween. Yeah. And uh, we talked about Beyond Black, a novel, um, which uh, talked uh, a lot about mediums and seances. And uh, we had a great time. It was a lot discussing of fun. it. But yeah, yeah, like we don't. We didn't play, man. We were we were really getting into the book, so it was a lot of fun. And uh, um, I have not picked the book for yet for the next one, um, but it will be in January. Okay, I believe January. Yeah, we believe. We believe. Yeah, sometime. In, <laughs> yeah, it was my it was my plan. Um, I think I think three months, you know, make is a good good time frame. But I'll um, I'll certainly have the the book selected soon, so we'll give people time to awesome. To awesome. get it and read it. So how about you, Pat? What's uh, been going on? Well, there's been a lot going on. Um, obviously, we haven't recorded an episode in a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and I have some updates to all of that. But I want to save that till the end of the episode. Yeah. Let's, 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 uh, let's keep going, though. Yeah, yeah. I want to keep now. the positiveness up. You let's know, do it. We'll, we'll definitely get to that. Um, we actually have some shout outs. Yeah. Um, so there are two ways that you can get a shout out on Ghostly in this particular section. Uh, the first way is to um, help us out by buying us some coffee on buymeacoffee.com. We love coffee. Yeah. And we have a couple of those actually this mm -hmm. time. And then the other way is that we, um, if you give us a review on Apple Podcast, mm -hmm. we will read it out. There you go. So um, why don't you do the buy me a coffee ones? I will. I will. So we had three different uh, buy me a coffees. Yes. Uh, first is Kevin, who we love. Um, Kevin's awesome. I mean, we love everybody, but uh, <laughs> especially <laughs> uh, Kevin. He has been listening to us for a long time and has always been very supportive. Um, and then the other two are people that, um, well, one is someone that I, I work with. Uh, Becky, who is amazing. Um, she's amazing at her job and she is an amazing friend and, um, oh, again, always supportive of Ghostly. Um, and it's very cute because, um, so she gave us a, sh uh, um, a coffee, um, and then so did her husband as a gift <laughs> to, uh, her to her for, so. the, for her anniversary um, because they love the show so much. So thank you, thank you, thank you to um, all of you, um, Dean, Becky, and Kevin for giving us coffees, multiple coffees each. Yeah, um, thank you guys so really much. really means so much to us. Um, and anyone that wants to give us coffee can go right on ghostlypodcast.com and yeah. click the coffee cup. And Becky and Dean are members now as well. Yeah, they are. So. That's right. They're also members. So yeah. they will get first uh, uh, look at future episode topics. Yeah. And get to chat with us. So And um, we have we have more planned for that. Too. We do. We, just, we do. Just haven't implemented them next yet. year. Yeah. Uh, OK, so we do have a review on Apple podcast and it is from uh, our friends at at Prairie Paranormal Pod. Yes. I believe that's the name of their podcast. Mm -hmm. um, so it 
It's called Great Spooky Fun, and it's a five star review. So uh, I mean, you you know you can't go wrong with a five star review. I think it's the best type of review. <laughs> uh, so uh, he said, I just recently started listening to this show, and I'm really enjoying it. The topics are interesting, interviews are great, and I like the skeptic Patrick versus believer Rebecca debate format. Oh, I thought he was a... I, yeah, I was going to say, I could tell you were real excited about I was. that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, he just likes the format. Uh, ultimately, uh, once the evidence is presented, it's left in the listener's hands to decide who won, either hashtag team believer or hashtag team skeptic. And I haven't experienced this type of audience engagement with any other podcast that I listen to. And, and that's a big thing for us, too. It is. We are so lucky. Yeah. We are so lucky that we have listeners that vote, that come to book clubs. I mean, it's right? amazing. Yeah. I mean, you know, when we created the podcast, that was our idea is that we didn't want it just to be us talking. We want to we wanna really hear what you say. Absolutely. And we give you a lot of different ways to to voice your opinions. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, good or bad. You got it. <laughs> uh, do we have any listener mail? Speaking of hearing from from uh, from people, right? Yes. Interacting. We do. This is um, another um, handwritten Ooh, letter yeah. that we got. I'm so excited. Uh, remember, you can mail us too. Um, just uh, go, go to our website and you'll have all, all of the information there on how to contact us because yeah. I don't remember the top of my head. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so go to ghostlypodcast.com and if you want our address, it's on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Phone number if you want to leave a voicemail. Yep. We have a lot of different ways for you guys to get a hold of us. Carry your pigeon, whatever you need. Okay, <laughs> so this one is from C, is how they signed it. Okay, okay. I, I know who C is, but I don't know if... That person, trying to be gender <laughs> non-specific on yes. that, uh, would would want us to say his or her name. Well, especially or since they, they signed it with the C. Yeah, we're gonna okay. we're gonna assume they. Right, that's we're gonna what stick they want. with C then. Okay, so uh, <laughs> I typed this out so that I could make sure I read this correctly. Forgive the handwriting, but you asked for this. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> I have worked in a, in a historic attraction for 20 years. We have many stories. To start, the original owner was very into the occult and the whole metaphysics movement at the beginning of the 20th century. So something lingers here. However, I have heard disembodied voices many times. When I know I'm alone, when, or sorry, I've heard disembodied voices many times when I know I'm alone. We hear music in the gallery and definite cold spots when it's 70 plus degrees. If I say hello to Susan, the owner, she is good and nothing happens when I am in there. If I forget, I get doors slamming, furniture moved, breezes where there are no open windows. Just a few of your curiosities. Let's see. Interesting. Yeah. So I think when she says Susan, the owner, I'm assuming she doesn't mean the current owner. <laughs> I'm guessing that's the original owner that she has to say hi to when she's there. Yeah. Um, I think we've talked about actually doing this as like an episode at some point too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. This so, is a, a place that we, we might be able to travel to. So. Yeah, exactly. So um, we're going to have to look into that. I haven't done any research into it besides just casual research. Yeah. So, so exciting. Yeah. Um, all right, so we're going to skip over the polls this episode. No, nope, no, nope, no, nope, no, nope. we never do that. Oh, why not? <laughs> we should start doing that sometimes. Uh, no, that's okay. again the whole part right. of that interactive thing. All right, so our latest episode, we talked about the Houdini seances. The question was, has Houdini ever been contacted with a seance? Uh, sure. Now, I got don't be scared. You, you have won several several of the votes lately my believers are not coming out as as, as they need to so um you don't know what's going to happen mm, okay let's see all right so yes 17.4 percent no 82.6 percent whoa that is like the biggest win i've ever had i think, I think it might be it's even up there. ones even ones that we know aren't real like amityville yeah it wasn't as big as right. this. This is just insane. Well, I think you and, and Jacob Mayfield convinced people. 
Jacob Mayfield was more on the believer side, I think, than... Uh, he's neutral. He's, he's neutral. neutral, maybe. Mm-hmm. <laughs> wow. Well, thank you guys for voting. And, um, you know, it might not have been exactly fair because we kept these polls open forever. That's true. These were open for a little bit longer than they usually are. <laughs> the longest that yeah. ever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it might not have been fair, but I'm going to take it as a win. That's okay. Okay. So we're really excited to be doing this episode about Mary Todd Lincoln. Uh, We had originally decided to do this episode as one of our seance episodes in October (laughs) (laughs) and to follow it up with a conclusion episode on seances. But with all that's been happening, um, we're just going to combine the two together. So this is going to be our conclusion episode as well. Um, That being said, though, we will focus a lot on Mary Todd Lincoln Um, as she's just a fascinating part of our nation's history. By the way, she never went by Mary Todd Lincoln. Really? She never did. I've never heard her called otherwise. Once she got married, it was Mary Lincoln. I mean, that makes sense. Was was Todd her maiden name then? Yes, Todd was her maiden name. How interesting. I wonder why history we've decided to call her that. I don't know. I mean, I've never heard anything anything about that. Very interesting. That is the truth. Okay. Um, We've already mentioned her a few times in other ghostly episodes, like our Abraham Lincoln episode, of course. Um, But in this episode, we'll take a more in-depth look at her history, both before and after Abraham Lincoln, and focus a little bit more on her spiritual side, um, which she probably had the most belief in the uh, paranormal-ish than any other first lady. I would yeah. say. I mean, there's been a few. Um, you, but... got, you got your Nancy Reagan. Right, you right. Know, but um, yeah, I think I think she, really she was the top of that list. She's the most famous, I would say, for definitely, sure. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. So do you have a ghost story for I us? I do. Let's kick it off with a ghost story. I know this is this was a hard one to do a ghost story on. Yeah, right? well, you know, I mean, it's, gonna, it's hard to be happy sounding with it. You know, it's not going to. But then again, should a ghost story be happy? I don't know. Who knows? All right, here we go. I am overjoyed. Yesterday, I experienced my loved ones again. After so much sorrow, it was a relief to know that I am still protected and watched over. Upon my arrival in Boston, I attempted to conceal who I was using a made-up name in order to keep the press from knowing and my only living son from complaining about my desire to talk to those we've lost. Using my pseudonym, I visited a famous medium, and I'm sure he did not know who I was. We sat around a table, and he used many elements of the spiritualist to reach out beyond the veil. What happened next will live with me forever. I saw my sweet Tad's face. I lost him a few years ago when I had already lost so many. I had seen poor Willie before, which gave me great comfort, but not Tad yet. Then, as we were speaking to the dead, I felt him. I felt my Abe's hands on my shoulders. He made his presence known to me because he knows how much I need it. But listener, that is not the end of my tale. So inspired I was by the feel of my late husband's hands that I went to a famous spirit photographer. I cannot wait to see what shows in this revealing medium. Wow. Yeah, and we're going to find out what that is later on. (laughs) Well, I think we should definitely take a break as we have a huge history section. All right, we got to get ready for that history. Oh, it's going to be big. All right. (laughs) All right, so be back in a second. Hey, guys. What I've learned over the last couple years is the key to a really good podcast is two things, getting plenty of Apple podcast reviews and lots of caffeine. You can help us with both of those. Head over to Apple Podcast, write us a review, and if you feel up to it, you could even buy us a cup of coffee. You can go to buymeacoffee.com slash ghostlypodcast or just go to ghostlypodcast.com and click on the Buy Us Coffee 
you can sign up for a membership or a one-time donation to us. It would really be appreciated. All right, welcome back to the history section, or as Bob has called it, hashtag Pat Facts. Pat's Facts. From a skeptic point of view. Pat's Facts. He presents it all to you. Pat's Facts. Facts. Pat Facts. <laughs> That's my, my version. <laughs> Pat Facts. I can't say it any other way. All right. So we're going to start off talking about Mary Todd's early life. Um, Mary Todd was born in Lexington, Kentucky on December 13th, 1818. She was the fourth child out of seven children born to Robert Smith Todd and Elizabeth uh, Eliza Parker Todd. Both of her great-grandfathers came from Ireland, actually, and some of her other ancestors came from England and Scotland. So she is definitely of that descent. Okay. Um, Mary Todd was actually given the name Mary Ann Todd, but with seven siblings, they decided to use that name Anne for one of her sisters. <laughs> <laughs> so she dropped the Anne. Um, Mary had the nickname of Molly. Not really sure how that got started. Like, I don't understand some of these, um, you know, Jack, John, Yeah, I was going to say, Mary, I think Molly, Molly is often a nickname for Mary. Again, yeah, no idea. I, I don't I don't get that, but nope. okay, hey, that's fine. Works. That's fine. Um, Mary's family was considered fairly wealthy, but Mary didn't live a life of glamour, though. Her life was tough, tougher than most people could even imagine. It gave her a more serious demeanor. When she was just six years old, her mother died while giving birth. As was common in those days, her father remarried. Uh, he married a woman named Elizabeth Betsy Humphrey, and they had an additional nine children. Okay, I think Mary Todd's um, father really liked to have <laughs> kids. Yeah, that is a lot of kids. 16 kids, right? Yep, a lot of kids. <laughs> Let's just say that Mary uh, really didn't get along with Betsy, though. Uh, with all those children, the Todd family needed a big home. And in 1832, they moved into what is now known as the Mary Todd Lincoln House, uh, which was probably not known as the Mary Todd Lincoln House in those days. <laughs> I'm guessing not, no. <laughs> uh, it was very, very elegant and had 14 rooms. And it was located at uh, 578 West Main Street in Lexington. Uh, I definitely want to visit that. that, that yeah, that'd be yeah. great. Since Mary's family was fairly upper class, she attended Madame Mentel's uh, finishing school. She learned to speak French fluently and studied dance, drama, music, and social graces, as well as literature. I'm sure that is something that impresses you there. Uh, yes. Uh, she was a very well-rounded and highly educated woman. She understood politics as well as any politician of those days, and her family was all part of the Whig Party. Uh, in October of 1839, Mary moved to Springfield, Illinois, to live with her sister, Elizabeth Porter Edwards. Elizabeth was married to Ninian. That's, yeah, Ninian. Let's do Ninian it. Ninian <laughs> W. <laughs> Edwards. Um, he was a son of a former governor. Okay. Mary was courted by several young men, one of which was Stephen A. Douglas. <gasps> yeah, right. Uh, who was a lawyer and a uh, Democratic Party politician. But Abraham Lincoln stood out, maybe because he was also a fellow Whig, uh, which is kind of funny because they became Republicans. Yes, yeah. but oh <laughs> my goodness, the rivalry between Douglas and Lincoln. Oh yeah, it was, it, was, it was big. Wow. So Mary actually met Lincoln in 1840 when she was 21 and he was 31. She was definitely smitten with him. I mean, after all, he was tall and gangly. <laughs> no, but he was a very kind man. Yes. That's what they all said about him. 
Uh, When Abe proposed to Mary, she accepted, even though her family didn't really like him because he was poor and didn't really have much political prospects. Uh. I would love to say that everything went perfect after that, but it really didn't. Uh, (laughs) They had a different kind of relationship uh, all throughout their relationship. There was definitely love there, Mm -hmm. but there was definitely um, this... They they were just completely different people at times. Okay. Um. So in 1841, Lincoln broke off the engagement. Wow. I go back and forth calling him Abe, Abraham, Lincoln, and Lincoln. So <laughs> well, you know, you're close friends now. You've talked yeah. about him a lot. So oh I think yeah, it's definitely all right. have. Yeah. Um. So some say that they got to got back together shortly after the break. Um, but others say that they didn't get back together until 1842. Mm. Whatever the case is, though, they got married very, fairly quickly after getting back together. They married on November 4th, 1842. Both Mary and Abe were considered abolitionists, which meant that they uh, sought the immediate and full emancipation of all slaves. Mary was probably an even bigger believer in this than Abe, but Abe became famous for this stance on slavery fairly early on in his Senate election against Stephen A. Douglas that Abe lost. Uh, Abe, with his newfound fame, really pushed himself to be successful to be a successful Springfield lawyer. During this time, Mary supervised their ever-growing house. They did have four children overall. They had Robert Todd Lincoln. They had uh, Eddie, or Edward Baker Lincoln, William Wallace Lincoln, Willie, and Thomas Lincoln, Tad. Mary was often left alone for months at a time to raise children while Abe was off being a circuit lawyer. In 1850, 10 months before the birth of Willie, Eddie passed away. The official cause of death was tuberculosis, but there are people that would say it was more likely a form of some kind of thyroid cancer Hmm. that Abe and um, the eldest son, Robert, had several signs of the genetic markers of that. Interesting. Yeah. Huh. Obviously, uh, this this crushed the Lincoln family at that point. Um, There are not many stories of Eddie, as he was four years old when he died, but... um, he always see, was seen as like a sweet little boy. Yeah, well, they're four. Absolutely. So we all know that Abraham Lincoln became our 16th president. So I won't go through the whole election process, the times he's won, the times he lost. Um, but to hear more about that, you can listen to our Abraham Lincoln episode. Life as a first lady was not an easy life for any first lady, but it seemed even more difficult for Mary than it did for most. Her personality, you know? Yeah. Um, Mary's family, being from a border state where uh, where slavery was permitted, meant that several of her half-brothers served in the Confederate Army and were killed during the Civil War. That's always difficult when, like, your family is split. Yeah. Which, you know, certainly happened at that time. Absolutely. But when your husband is the president and you know, kind of leading the charge, that's definitely got to be a divide for you. Definitely. Yeah. Um, You know, it it was difficult because Mary really held true to her beliefs and those of Abe's, you know, of slavery was not was not right. So, I mean, they had to do it. Right. And I'm sure she wished that her half brothers wouldn't have been on that side. Um, And this is something that we don't really think about when we think about Mary Todd Lincoln. We think about, you know, Mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln died. We think of her sons dying. We don't think about, you know, a lot of her, a lot of her half brothers dying. No, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Critics describe Mary's manners as coarse and pretentious. (laughs) She had troubles negotiating White House social responsibilities and rivalries. Mm. Uh, She was accused of overspending when it came to refurbishing the White House and buying new China. And this caused a lot of turmoil between her and Abe. Um, Even though Congress eventually approved 
most of these expenses, he thought it made them look bad because the country was at war with itself yeah. and they're buying new China for the White House. She was, I believe, a bit of a shopaholic. I'm uh, just going to say. I think that was how she dealt with her grief. That's true. She had a lot of grief. Because the life. more grief that she went through, the more that she spent. Yep, yep. Um, Mary also suffered from very severe headaches or what we would call now migraines. Mm. Um, she also suffered from chronic depression. Her headaches got even worse when she suffered a head injury in a carriage accident during her White House years. Oh, wow. Never heard that. Yep. Uh, she had a history of mood swings, uh, fierce temper, public out, outburst throughout Lincoln's presidency, as well as excessive spending. And it has led some historians and psychologists to argue that Mary suffered from bipolar disorder. Oh, well, that's interesting. Yeah. I suppose, yeah, we'd have to really see, like, does she... Was it a wild swing between them or what? But Well, she definitely had the um, depressive side to it. Definitely. And, uh, the manic side was the buying and yeah. stuff. So, I mean, yeah. it's possible. It's possible. You know? Hmm. I, you know, it's really hard to diagnose people with, with mental illnesses after they're gone. Right. You know? Yeah. So, on February 20th, 1862, Willie passed away of typhoid fever in the White House. Oh. Uh, now, Willie and Tad became ill in early 1862, uh, possibly with typhoid fever. Tad was relatively lightly affected, but Willie gradually weakened, and his parents spent much uh, of their time at, at his bedside. Mary remained in bed for three weeks and was unable to attend Willie's funeral or look after Tad. Abraham Lincoln took solace in caring for and comforting Tad. Uh, I think Tad was his favorite, actually. No, Willie was his favorite. Yeah? Yeah. They were, people said, well, oh, yeah. I sh you know, that Willie was very much like Lincoln. Yeah. And, you know, had that same sense of humor and all of that. But I, who knows? I mean, they obviously they loved all their children. That was just, well, at least that's what I got from reading the Lincoln and the Bardo uh, Okay, yes. Yeah. Well, I do know that uh, both Willie and uh, Tad were a bit of troublemakers. Too. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, yeah, you know, Tad um, what, remained ill after the death of his brother. Um and had to deal with some grieving with that as well. So that was really hard on, on Tad. Uh, this was one of the most devastating moments for both of the Lincolns. They dealt with grief differently, and uh, this strained their marriage even more. Mm -hmm. um, Mary was so distraught for many months that Lincoln had to employ a nurse to look after her. So, of course, we all know that Abraham Lincoln was assassinated on April 14th, 1865, so I won't go through all the details of that, but some things that we should mention are um, it was announced in the newspaper that the Lincolns would be attending the theater that evening, and they enjoyed going to the theater. That was the one thing that they really both um, could bond yeah. over. Um, Mary got a headache and wanted to stay home, but Abe, Abe didn't want to allow that because it was announced in the newspaper. And especially, um, this was, you know, shortly after the Civil War had mm -hmm. ended, yeah. it would have looked really bad then. Clara Hamilton Harris and her fiancé, Major Henry Rathbone, were guests of the Lincolns to the theater that evening. Now, I don't want to be scandalous. But I read that those two were step siblings of each Ooh. other. I'm just wow. putting that out there as a weird little thing that I wow. read. <laughs> hmm. Interesting. Uh, during the third act, the president and Miss Lincoln drew close together, holding uh -huh. hands while enjoying the play. Mary whispered to her husband, who was holding her hand, What will Miss Harris think of my hanging on to you so? The president smiled and replied, she won't think anything about it. That was the last word spoken between the Lincolns. Uh, when the bullet struck Lincoln, Mary was holding his hand. Lincoln was brought across the street to the Peterson house, and Mary and their eldest son, Robert, sat with Lincoln throughout the night and into the following morning. And at one point, uh, Secretary of War Edmund M. Stanton ordered Mary from the room as she was so unhinged with grief. 
But shortly before 7 a.m., Mary was allowed to return to Lincoln's side, and she again seated herself by the president, kissing him and calling him every endearing name. And then he passed, I think it was like 722 or something Mm -hmm. like that. I have been in that room. Have you? Okay. Is it a big room? No. Yeah, that's what I've heard. Uh, So after Abe's death, Mary returned to Illinois and lived in Chicago with her sons. While in the White House, Mary had, had not only overspent on things for the White House, but also on clothes and jewelry. Most of that had to be returned or sold. She didn't have much money at all. Um, she kind of did, but she didn't. She was one of those kind of people that always thought that she was going to be poor. Mm-hmm. In fact, what she would do is she had like $55,000 that she would sew into her dresses. Oh, really? Which, by the way, after uh, after Abe died, she only wore black. Mm. Even though she bought dresses of various colors, <laughs> she only wore black. Gotcha. Interesting. Well, and I think she's also one of those ones that like she probably I know that she got a pension and different things. And we're going to talk about that. Oh, yeah. good. OK. But the idea that, um, you know, she probably had enough to live on, but she just like like to spend money. <laughs> yeah. Uh, her friend and former dressmaker, Elizabeth Keckley published a book about her uh, time as being a slave. Um, Elizabeth was a slave. Mm. Um, this book provided some insight into the character and life of Mary, but Mary and much of the press of the day saw this as a breach of friendship. Mm. But today's historians find this as a valuable look into the lives of the Lincolns. Mary had lobbied for a, uh, for a pension for first ladies, and on July 14th, 1870, it was passed by Congress, barely. Uh, it provided $3,000 a year, which is about the equivalent to $61,000 a year in today's money. Okay, gotcha. Good. Um, on July 15th, 1871, Tad Lincoln passed away. So this is the third of her four children that passed away. Robert uh, went on to live past her and became a pretty successful uh, attorney as well. So the cause of death has has been, um, they you know they they say it could have been tuberculosis. They said uh, it could be pneumonia. It could have been congestive heart failure. They really don't know. He yeah. was he was 18 years old. When well, he died. and he had been so sick when he was young too. I mean, exactly. you just don't know. Yeah, you know, the typhoid yeah. fever can really you know linger on. Sure. Um, when Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, Tad said this: "Pa is dead. I can hardly believe that I shall never see him again. I must learn to take care of myself now." Yes, Pa's dad, and I am only Tad Lincoln now, little Tad, like other little boys. I am not a president's son now. I won't have many presents anymore. Well, I will try and be a good boy, and will hope to go someday to Pa and Brother Willie in heaven. Oh, Yeah. The death of her son, Tad, in July 1871, following the death of the two other sons and her husband, brought on an overpowering grief and depression. Her surviving son, Robert, a rising young Chicago lawyer, was alarmed at his mother's increasingly erratic behavior. Hmm. Robert initiated proceedings to have Mary institutionalized. On May 20th, 1875, following a trial, a jury committed her to a private asylum in Batavia, Illinois, named Bellevue Place. After the trial, Mary tried to commit suicide. She went to several different pharmacies and ordered a tincture made up made with enough um, opium to do the job. And luckily, a pharmacist gave her a placebo instead. Mm. After three months, she devised an escape plan. She wrote letters to her lawyer and personal friend and to the Chicago Sun-Times. To avoid a bigger scandal, she was released to her sister Elizabeth again in Springfield. Go, Mary. Yeah. She got herself out. So um, that made me think about some stuff. Um, one of the things that we've talked about a lot on previous ghostly episodes was the spiritualist movement in the United States. Uh, it took place between the 1840s and the 1920s. Mm-hmm. And um, 
it really popularized things like seances and um, other forms of divination mm-hmm. and speaking with the dead. Mm-hmm. So um, this was definitely something that was becoming popular. I'm sure Mary uh, helped make it more popular. Mm-hmm. Um, but another thing that I really started thinking about is, you know, we did our Dr. White sanitarium right. episode. Um and during that, we started talking about how sanitariums became popular in the United States. Mm-hmm. And that was around this time. It was like 10 years um, after Mary was put in a sanitarium. Interesting. Uh, Bellevue Place, where Mary Todd Lincoln stayed, was uh, opened sometime around 1867 by Dr. Richard Peterson. And it was considered a private rest home, but also served as a sanitarium for women. Hmm. And... Um, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's interesting, though, to think about that she was, again, I, I love how all of our stuff matches up, I it guess. Does, yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? It gets connections. Yeah, when you look at the time frame of these things, it seems pretty obvious that, um, you know, if this had happened prior to that, it, mm-hmm. she might, you know, prior to 1867. Right. She probably wouldn't have been put into a sanitarium. Right. Or today. You know what exactly. I mean? It's just, yeah. They would have just, you know, oh, Mary. Mm-hmm. So I I just want to say that I think that Mary has gotten a bad rep in U.S. history. I think she's often been seen as this crazy woman. Uh, when in actuality, it's just her grief was just too much for any person to deal with on, on her own. Mm-hmm. I mean, and, you know, even when Abe was alive, they didn't grieve the same way. Mm-hmm. Uh, she would oftentimes be off in her room. And he would be, you know, going to um, the gravesite to mourn and stuff. Right. And they just they just grieve differently. Uh, I think the timing of the spiritualist movement and the start of the sanitarium's popularity in the U.S. played a major role in how people saw her. Mm-hmm. So Mary spent the next four years traveling through Europe and took up residence in France for a little while. Hmm, I did not know that. But during this time, her health really started to de- uh, decline. She suffered from severe cataracts uh, that left her eyesight largely diminished, uh, which caused her to fall often. Mm. And in 1879, she suffered a spinal cord injury from a fall from a stepladder. Wow. She successfully petitioned Congress for an increase in her in her pension and also got like a one-time bonus. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah. Go Mary. Um, yeah, she did really well. She was really good with politics. Yeah, and, obviously. Uh, especially, you know, the Republican Party was um, just starting off with Abe Lincoln. So mm-hmm. um, she made a lot of connections during right, that. Right. So in the early 1880s, she was forced to return to Springfield and to live out her final days with her sister. Her health kept her from doing anything else besides just living yeah. there. Uh, she needed around-the-clock care. Mm. And on July 15th, 1882, exactly 11 years after Tad died, wow. to the day, wow. she collapsed. She lapsed into a coma and died the next morning of a stroke at the age of 63. Her funeral service was held at First Presbyterian Church in Springfield, Illinois. Wow, what an interesting story. Yeah. And we didn't even cover, you know, so many of the like political intrigues and all the things I'm sure she was involved with. Oh, yeah. But just um, what an amazing woman. I mean, she was, yeah. A tragic. Very much so. But um, obviously, you know, was able to, to accomplish some yeah. things too, you know. And she was um, well known in her day too, even, even after a passed away. I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, she was constantly in the paper, you mm-hmm. know, probably for not great things, but, um, <laughs> you know, she was, she was definitely a, a, um, a pop figure yeah. of those days. Interesting. Yep. All right. So do you have anything to add to the history? I don't. I think we, we, you, man, you did a good job and I tried to add in a few little things there. So I think we're good. Yeah, and I've passed by um, that Bellevue place. Oh, right, yes, a me bunch too. Of times. Me yeah. too. Yeah. Oh, actually, I will mention this as well. Um, is that uh, so? Batavia, Illinois, is real close to us, and that's where where that house, or uh, sorry, the the home was. Um, but I also, in my research, found out that there is a hotel, or what used to be a hotel in St. Charles, Illinois, which is also close to us, 
where um, Abe and Mary would often visit some of their friends that owned this hotel, or wow. they, and they would stay there while visiting Colonel Fabian, who's our big famous person around here, <laughs> that, nah. um, um, was was friends with them, and uh, and and they claim though there's one article I read that there were potentially seances that Ooh. happened in this ho- uh, hotel in St. Charles. Um, but I really couldn't find a whole lot of details about it. So we're not going to talk any more about it, but I, I just thought that was such an interesting, you know, Chicago connection and local <laughs> Illinois connection. We're just surrounded by Lincoln's here. Yeah, absolutely. In our, this is in the our, land of Lincoln. It is. We're in the land of Lincoln. That's why we love it. All right, so maybe we should take a break and then we'll get into the debate. Let's do it. All right. Hey, listeners, did you know there's a way to share with the world whether you're a hashtag team believer or hashtag team skeptic? Or for those who need it, hashtag team the middle. It's our store called Ghostly Gear. Yep. And we even have custom ghostly designs like Microclimate or even the Easter Island Massacre or of the Ghostly logo. Just visit our Ghostly Gear store right on ghostlypodcast.com to order your T-shirt, hoodie, mug, mask, whatever. (laughs) Okay, okay. I think we got it. Um, They just need to visit ghostlypodcast.com and click on Ghostly Gear to order right on the website. And send us any ideas that you have for new merch. Exactly. Order your merch today and send us a pic of you in your ghostly gear. All right, we're back for the debate. Okay. You ready for this? I am ready for this. Yes. <laughs> well, before we start our debate, I, I wanted to mention a few things about Mary Todd Lincoln and spiritualism. You certainly talked um, a little bit about it, but um, you know, I wanted to just talk about specifically the time um, that we're referencing. You know, the Civil War was really uh, a big moment for spiritualism. Yes. Because so many people weren't allowed to be with their family members when they passed. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, they were away and they never even got to, you know, maybe even see the body or any of that. And so spiritualism became this way of getting that final last word. Absolutely. With someone that they lost. Um, so I think that was a, a big piece of it. Um, and so it really wasn't unusual, you know, that Mary Lincoln sought out mediums. Um, We have proof that she read books on spiritualism. You know, I mean, obviously you just went through how many losses she suffered. (laughs) And, uh, but also just again, that it was, it was not unusual at the time. I mean, at least it it wasn't like it was everybody believed. I mean, certainly people ridiculed her in Washington circles and, uh, and all that. But, you know, there is absolutely proof that she had seances at the white house that lincoln was present for at least some of them yes and um you know whether or not anything happened at those that's what we're going to debate but you know it wasn't you know if you could imagine that today i think (laughs) it would be a more scandalous thing than it was oh yeah then i think more what was scandalous is actually people were upset with her because they're like hey you at least got to be with your son when he passed away and your husband, when he passed away, I didn't get to do that. So that probably hurt her a lot as well. Yeah. You know, Uh, and I, you had mentioned a a story about uh, one time that Lincoln or that Abe Mm -hmm. was, was fed up with the whole notion and like Mm -hmm. tried to disprove it. Yeah. So we're going to definitely talk about that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was a really good story. It is a good story. So, Um, I just wanted to mention a few quotes that I found from Mary Todd uh, Lincoln on the subject before we we get into her her, uh, stories here. Sounds good. Um, So the first is, uh, she said, a very slight veil separates us from the loved and lost. Mm. Uh, She wrote to a friend, though unseen by us, they are very near. Okay. So that I think that very much captures, you know, her. But she also wrote... Um, to a friend in 1869, 
I am not either a spiritualist, but I sincerely believe our loved ones who have gone, only gone before are permitted to watch over those who were dearer to them in life. I should have lost my reason long ere this if I had entertained other views than I do on this subject. So she did not ever say that she was a spiritualist. Yeah. You know, it wasn't like that was her religion or anything. Yeah. Um, but she, again, we have proof that she read books written by spiritualists. She visited <laughs> mediums all the time. Did spiritualist things. And, yeah, yeah. You know, so it, so she, she certainly believed in life after death and being visited by spirits. And that is what kept her going. Okay. Yeah. All right. So the first thing we're going to talk about, and again, <laughs> Just like everything in this episode, there's lots to talk about. Um, but I wanted to talk about Charles J. Colchester. 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 Okay. Um, now, there is a lot with him that um, just something that's aside from the, this story is supposedly he was also acquainted with or close associates with Booth. John Wilkes mm, Booth. Interesting. And that supposedly he tried to warn Lincoln that something could happen. Colchester. Colchester. Not Booth. No, no. <laughs> Col- <laughs> Colchester warned Lincoln like, hey, you should be careful Yeah. because somebody else warned Lincoln and he said to that person, oh yeah, Colchester keeps warning me too. Yeah. So it is interesting. Um, but that's not the story for today. So one of the bi- he was one of the biggest mediums that Mary saw. Mm-hmm. He was red faced, blue eyed. He was I- an Englishman, had a large mustache, um, and he claimed to be the son of a duke, an illegitimate son of a duke. There was never, I don't know if we ever had any real proof of that, but that's what he claimed. Um, he professed to have remarkable powers. He could read sealed letters, cry out the names of visitors, deceased friends, cause apparitions to appear, and produce words on his forearm in blood red letters. Wow. Ooh. You know what I, I'm realizing nowadays is that there's not enough politicians or mediums that have facial hair anymore. I think oh. we need to bring that back. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, Lincoln was particularly intrigued with Colchester's eerie ability to summon noises in different parts of a room. So this is kind of what you were saying. So yeah. Mary just kept talking about this guy, like he's amazing, he's amazing. So Lincoln finally mm, went to one of these. If she had a little bit of a crush. Well, I don't know, but I didn't read anything about that. But <laughs> um, but so the president went to one, and so he was intrigued by this. So like any rational person, the president wanted to understand what was happening. So he asked Colchester to submit to an examination by Joseph Henry, the secretary of the Smithsonian Institute. Interesting. Um, so uh, Colchester agreed, um, and H- Henry was not able to figure it out. Like he couldn't, he was like, I know there's something, but he couldn't figure it out. However, by chance... I believe it was Henry met up with a guy on a train years later who had sold to Colchester the contraption that he Uh, used, which was a noisemaker strapped under his arm. Like a farting thing? I don't know. Fart, fart, fart? Fart, fart, fart. I don't know what noise (laughs) it made, but something. Um, Should have called in Houdini. (laughs) Well, I think this was a little bit before. Yes. Um, So then, um, but anyways, but at the moment, Henry couldn't disprove it. So okay. then Henry asked Noah Brooks to examine Colchester. Um, also at this moment, um, actually, Mrs. Lincoln went to Brooks because um, Colchester was trying to blackmail her. Ooh. Yeah. So we don't I like think the crush Colchester. Was over I think, yeah. That, yeah. Um, so here's the thing. I just love this. It's a little bit long. And to be honest, I think this is going to be pretty obvious what we what we're gonna rate this evidence, <laughs> okay. but I just like this story. So this is how Noah Brooks recol- recollects what happened the night that he was testing Colchester. Okay. After the company had been seated around the table in the usual approved manner, and the lights were turned out, the silence was broken by the thumping of a drum, the twanging of a banjo, and the ringing of bells. All all of which instruments had been laid on the table ready for use. By some hocus pocus, it was evident Colchester had freed his hands from the hands of those who sat on each side of him and was making music in the air. Loosening my hands from my neighbors, who were unbelievers, I rose 
and grasping in the direction of the drumbeat, grabbed a very solid and fleshy hand in which was held a bell that was being thumped on a drum head. I shouted, strike a light. Strike a light? <laughs> yeah, because you, know, you can turn on the lights. Yeah, okay. So like, I love that. That's great. My friend, after what appeared to be an unconscionable length of time, lighted a match. But meanwhile, somebody had dealt me a severe blow with the drum, the edge of which cut a slight wound on my forehead. When the gas was finally lighted, a singular spectacle was presented of the son of, of the Duke, firmly grasped by a man whose forehead was covered with blood while the arrested scion of nobility was glowering at the drum and bells, which he still held in his hands. Wow. I mean, I got to say that takes a lot of talent, I think. Right. I mean, it was definitely a, you know, a big, a big, it took a lot of practice to get that. Very, very theatrical. Very theatrical. And so then what happened, actually, I think the blackmail happened after this not too long after it though because um brooks then went to him and was like remember me and pointed to his forehead (laughs) and basically was like get out you better be out of town by tomorrow or you're going to be in jail and that's how harry potter was born (laughs) (laughs) that was the inspiration (laughs) so um so that is a a story of one of her seances nice um i i i I don't think there's a lot of debate to happen, but what do you think? (laughs) (laughs) I mean, that's that's a little bit ridiculous there. Um, (laughs) I'm going to say that I think it was fake. You're thinking it's fake, huh? I, I think it was fake. <laughs> thinking this guy wasn't wasn't real. It's a feeling that I have, you know, <laughs> that it just it kind of tells me maybe this wasn't on the up and up. Yeah, yeah. So, I what, yeah. So what's your rating then? Oh, a zero. A zero. Yeah. yeah. I I'm actually going to give this one a zero as well. You gave something a zero. I am giving it a zero. Wow. I'm, you know, Welcome I mean, Welcome to the Skeptic Club. <laughs> <laughs> well, mm-hmm. I, you know, this is one where it's pretty clear. The, the this this guy not 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 a not a medium not a medium no, no. definitely taking advantage of my Mary Todd a Lincoln shyster. I don't like it he was yeah. a con artist he was a con artist all right all right let's go with evidence two now evidence two so now there's two pieces of evidence regarding um, a family called the Lorries the Lorries so okay. I'm not gonna go super in, de- in depth but um, a little bit about them um, shortly after Willie died. Uh, Mary was introduced to the Lorries, a well-known group of mediums that were located in Georgetown. Okay. Um, so she found comfort in the seances held by the group mm-hmm. that then she started to ho- host her own in the Red Room at Ooh. the White House. I think that's always like you see uh, lots of articles of like the, the Red, Red Room, room seances <laughs> at the White House. Um, so there's evidence to suggest she hosted as many as eight seances in the White House and that um, Lincoln was there for at least a few of them. Um, they were such an effective coping mechanism for uh, Mary that she once remarked to her half sister that Willie lives. He comes to me every night and stands at the foot of the bed with the same sweet, adorable smile that he always has had. He does not always come alone. Little Eddie, so the son that died mm-hmm. at four, is sometimes with him. So this isn't so much about the actual seances, but the the effect of the seances. So after going to a number of these seances, she claimed it brought her peace because she could see Willie and sometimes Eddie coming to her at night. Okay, and that's that's exactly what I was going to say. Um, so in this you know time period, uh, well, like nowadays, if you know you're going through a lot of grief and you're not able to process that well, you will often see a therapist. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, being a support group. I was thinking about that earlier when we were talking about Mary. It's like, man, now she'd be in therapy. Yeah. You know, yeah. get some medication. Um, and, you know, that's the thing. They didn't really have those things then. And so I really believe that these seances were very, very helpful for her in processing her grief. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, I really think that this, like, when I think of seances, I think of it from a side, not just as the skeptic, but as somebody that has gone through a lot of grief in my life. My, you know, my father died when I was 13. My mother died when I was 25. Various family members in between that. I've had to process a lot of grief and I didn't get therapy until much later. 
And I can definitely tell you that, yeah, I do spend erratically sometimes, you know, and I do, you know, and I did do this whole thing where I was trying to contact the dad and stuff like that. I can really relate to a Mary Todd Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think it was very helpful for her. But no, I mean, this doesn't speak to any kind of truth that could possibly be there. When when I hear stories of like seances where they're like, and, you know, great grandfather Jebediah told us <laughs> where to find the box that held the key to the clock that he loved, you mm-hmm. know, those are things that I, I find um, more compelling evidence. This doesn't have anything that says this was true. I mean, was it true that she went to these seances? Yes. Was it true that she had these seances? Yes. But I think this was more like an emotional support group for her. Yeah, I think I'm I, I'm torn on this one because, you know, she says that she, you know, sees her Willie and, and sometimes Eddie um, and that, that she, you know, that this was a result of the seances, but I don't really know if that's true. You know, I mean, was that her wishful thinking that she could see them? That's what she needed. You know, I, I just, I don't know it, it that one's, uh, that one's, it's a hard one because it, the grief I think does really, really push that in there. But, yeah. you know, I mean, we also know the white house has a lot of spirits and a lot of energy. So I guess I don't know for sure. Um, so what would you say for your rating? Um, as far as this being a paranormal thing, mm-hmm. I'm going to give it a zero. But as far as satisfying a need that she had, I would go all the way to a 10 for that. Mm-hmm. I mean, it definitely did. Sure, sure. Uh, I'm going to give it a four. A four, You okay. know, I mean, I'm going to allow for the possibility that maybe she saw something, um, but I don't know but that it's likely. Not. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, we're not done with the Lori's, though. This oh, okay. one, to me, is a little more compelling. All right. Good. Okay. Good, good. This one doesn't actually involve Mary so much as Abe. Mm. So, Nettie Colburn Maynard um, was... That's um, a nice name, too. I know. Was um, either with the Lori's or their daughter, I think, something like that. So, she was a part of the, the Lori group. Um, so, she wrote a memoir called Was Abraham Lincoln a Spiritualist? Published um, in 1891. Mm. She claims that it was Nettie herself who acted as the medium for this particular seance, um, not Mrs. Lori or Belle, who were the tr- traditional ones. Sure. Um, this is the evening of February 5th, 1863, um, when President Lincoln accompanied his wife to one of the Lori's popular seances. When Lincoln asked the spirit she had channeled about the current situation regarding the war, she writes he received the following reply. That is a very precarious state of things existed. Sorry, that a very precarious state of things existed at the front where General Hooker had just taken command. The army was totally demoralized, regiments stacking arms, refusing to obey orders or to do duty, threatening a general retreat, declaring their purpose was to return to Washington. A vivid picture was drawn of the terrible state of affairs greatly to the surprise of all present, save to the chief to whom the words were addressed. When the picture had been painted in vivid colors, Mr. Lincoln quietly remarked, you seem to understand the situation. Can you point out the remedy? The remedy suggested was that he go to the front in person, taking with him his wife and children and avoiding the high grade officers, seek out the tents of private soldiers and inquire to their grievances. In other words, he should show himself to be the father of the people. Now, I picked this particular piece, but there's also another story of her um, giving another or maybe it was at the same time or at a different time where she also tells him to support the um, the Emancipation Proclamation as well. Um, not in such direct words, but basically like you need to push forward with this thing that you're scared to do, basically. So I think this is an intriguing question. You know, she claims that she had no knowledge of what was happening on the battlefield, that this was speaking above her intellectual ability at the time she was young, um, that she couldn't have known these things. Um, But, you know, is she just giving good advice? Well, I mean, this was during the Civil War, so um, this was already happening. Things were already going down, and um, everyone knew 
Lincoln's point of view in this regard, because that's why the Civil War started, because of how the South viewed what Lincoln was going to do. Um, if you think of a war within your own country, it's pretty obvious that there's going to be a lot of people that aren't going to be willing to do the things that they need to do. And so I think that, I mean, given what you read, it seems logical to be able to say that if there's a civil war in a country and it's brother fighting brother sometimes, there's going to be people refusing to obey orders. Um, her telling him what to do, I don't even know if that is the best advice, uh, actually. Um, but um, that is something very much is something that Lincoln would want to do. That, that was the kind of person he was. So I, I don't think that this is out of the norm to be able to, for her to have imagined. Um, I don't think it was like, you know, sort of omen, give me sight beyond sight kind of thing. <laughs> you know, I really think it was more like, hmm, yeah, we're at war with each other. Uh, yeah, this is how people are going to feel. Thunder. Yeah. Thunder. <laughs> 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 so um, that is my opinion of it. I don't think that this plays into any kind of paranormal or any kind of um, I, I don't think that this really has anything to do with a seance or anything like that okay. as far as superpowers mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. anything. Well, I do think, you know, again, I'm torn on this one because I do think that there is something to be said that this was a, a young girl, that she wouldn't have been privy to a lot of this military information. Um, and so it is kind of interesting that she would be able to pinpoint things so so specifically. However, um, the spiritualist movement was also uh, in some ways a very progressive movement. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I, I do think that it was often used to, I'm sure it was used to, to make money, um, but it would sometimes also be used to kind of put forward a lot of views. Oh, absolutely. This would be a way that you could influence a president potentially, you know? And so sure. who knows if someone had, if, if it was well known that the Lincolns visited the Lorries. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I can't, I can't I can't rule out the idea that someone went and talked to her. Yeah. Knowing that she might have this opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and absolutely. to tell her what she or should say. She could have read the paper. I mean, well, she, she said she didn't I don't know that didn't... it was in the paper though. Like I don't think people knew how bad some of that was. I think mm. they tried to back then papers were a little more, you know, they didn't always print stuff. So. Well, I so I'm going to rate this evidence as a one. Okay. Just because, I mean, there is a little bit more to this than the rest of the stuff that we've talked about, mm -hmm. but it's not enough where it would be like some startling detail that she couldn't know Yeah. in other ways. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to give it a five. Okay. Again, like I said, a little more believable for me, but still shaky. All right. All right. You ready for the last one? Oh, the last one? Okay, yes. Okay. So this was the story, our ghost right. story for today. Um, so when Tad died in 1871, Mary was again, you know, very sad, um, you know, in, in despair. Um, so sometime late that year or early um, uh, 1872, um, Mary traveled to Moravia, New York, um, where she visited a number of spiritualists. Um, and during that time, she believed she saw Tad's face during one of the seances. She then moved on to Boston for a two-week stay where she again <laughs> went to a medium. Um, and uh, by the way, during this whole time, she did claim to, or she did travel under a pseudonym. Like she was trying to to be incognito. So people, like she didn't introduce herself as, as Mary Todd Lincoln or Mary Lincoln or Molly Lincoln or whatever. Um, so, uh, but during this visit in Boston, there is where she claimed to have seen Lincoln's spirit and felt him put his hands on her shoulders. Mm -hmm. um, this is when, some people may have heard of this, after that experience, she went to William Mumler who's a famous spirit photographer where he took the famous picture of her with Lincoln standing over her with his hands on her shoulders. Um, you know, which she had just felt at this 
other sands. Sure. Uh, well, I cannot speak to what she saw, you know, or what she felt, um, because that's a very personal thing. Mm-hmm. And she might have felt it because of some, you know, some kind of uh, trickery or something like that. It might have been something like that. The rooms are really dark during seances, and you never know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I can't really speak to that, but I can speak to the picture. Mm-hmm. That is one thing that I can speak to. Um, so back in those days, uh, they would do this double exposure thing that mm-hmm. they had. And um, it wasn't easy to prove back in those days because, I mean, the photography equipment wasn't the greatest and people, it would cost a lot of money to have all these things and stuff. So there wasn't as much um, people that could look into that. But modern day people have examined this photo and it is a classic double exposure, meaning that there was a picture of Lincoln already and then... um, they took an exposure with Mary in front of it. Yeah. yeah. And it, you know, it all gets developed into that one, that one picture. And it looks um, kind of believable for those days. But I mean, if you look at it now, I mean, seriously, it it's, you could, I mean, you could spot it with your eye. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll put it in our show notes for sure. Yeah. Uh, for people to see. Um, I think, you know, Mumler, again, I, I listened to um, the most notorious uh, podcast and they had a, a, an author on who wrote a whole book on Mumler. And it was, yeah, there's definitely a lot of evidence that he was yeah. not uh, a real spirit photographer. No, you know? but he gave them what they, what they needed at that time. Yeah. You know, she needed to have that kind of proof and to, to feel that closeness with her, with her, belated husband and um i mean so like i don't like that money was exchanged probably for this and probably a good amount of money yeah i would imagine um but you know i do recognize that he was um giving her something that she needed yeah yeah so So what's your rating for that one I'm going to have to go zero. It's pretty much been disproven. So Okay. Uh, I'll say that one I'm going to give, I'm going to give a four, just not necessarily so much for the picture, but for what she saw and felt during the seances. I don't know. Maybe. Okay. All right. Um, so um, what is your overall rating for her? So this one's hard because we are kind of rolling together seances and Mary Todd Lincoln. Um, but I have to say the stories that we have chosen um, have made it really more difficult for me to be as supportive of seances as I have been in the past. I think when you involve so many people mm-hmm. and money, yeah. you know, like this is different than just like a one-on-one or, you know, someone that you go to, um, as a friend or, or even, I don't know, again, just kind of like a, um, a, a more friendly situation. You know what I mean? When it's a big group of people and the lights are out and there's things happening, I just think it opens it up to so much more trickery. Absolutely. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to say a five for overall seance, overall seance. Like, do I think that there, I have absolutely visited mediums. Um, I know this is something we haven't, um, talked about cause I was, I was saving it. Um, but you know, I, I did visit a medium, um, twice. And the first time I saw her, um, I really did get information and she did speak to relatives of mine that had passed. That was very, um, um, well, believable you, to me. Yeah. That you felt, I that felt she did. Yeah. that she did. Um, but the second time I went back, it was interesting. It felt like it was like the end of the day and she was in a rush and it was, she was not in the mode and it was all like, I could tell that this was her just doing the like things that you saying the things that you'd say to somebody in this situation, Mm. you know, and it didn't feel as real and nobody really came through and none of the things that she said, it was, it was almost like, and then she was trying to sell like some diet, food or you know like just like it was so it was so disappointing so you know i do i think that there really are mediums out there that are potentially able to speak to those that have passed yes but in a seance i think it's way too easy for um there to be trickery 
Well, for me, I'm going to... Um, Oh, you didn't give... Oh, you, that five, was my five. five. My five. Okay, yeah, yes. sorry. How about you? Uh, I'm going to have to go... I'm going to say a one on that. Um, just because, you know, there has been times that I've heard things where I, I don't know how they could have had the information otherwise. But it, I, I, I don't know if it necessarily proves that there was mm-hmm. um like just because i don't know how mm-hmm. doesn't mean that they didn't get it some other way mm-hmm. and in none of the um cases that we've brought up have i found that to be true right uh i can always figure out that there's other ways mm-hmm. and there's more logical ways than speaking with the dead um you know I visited some mediums in my day as well because I, you know, had a a need and a desire to speak with my father. Hmm. And, um, you know, it sometimes I felt comforted by it, but I never felt like like this was actually my father that I spoke to mm-hmm. or that, you know, that person was speaking to. Mm-hmm. I felt like... I I felt like I got out of it what I what I needed just like Mary. Gotcha. Um so yeah, I'm going to I'm going to go with a one just just because, you know, there's that little bit of want and desire that I have to believe in this. I just I just can't really I I wouldn't put any money on it. That's for sure. Okay. Gotcha. All right, so are we ready for our closing arguments? Yeah, let's do it. All right, so that brings us to the closing arguments. This is our last chance to convince you to vote our way, and we are each given one minute of uninterrupted time. We will time each other on our cell phones to keep each other honest. And Rebecca, Mm -hmm. are you ready? I am. And I have one minute on the clock, and it starts now. All right, so I do think that seances... Um, can be real. I do think that a group of people can reach out and talk to spirits. Um, I do think that there are mediums out there that are closer to the other side of the veil than others. However, I think we always need to be very cautious anytime we're in that kind of situation, especially a big showy seance with a lot of people. I think most often those are not real, that they are being done to make money, to be a show, then that can be fun as long as you know that that's what you're getting into. Um, But I don't want to take away from, I do think there really are people that can have moments where they speak um, to those we've lost and um, that that can bring us comfort um, or even information that we wouldn't have known otherwise. Um, But I don't think that it's always that way. Whoa. All right. I made it. You did. All right. You ready? I am ready. Yes. Okay. And go. So um, I've been very uh, nice about how I feel about seances, but there's a, there's this other side to it that <laughs> I have a great deal of anger for because what I find happens a lot of times is people are taken advantage of. People... Um, I, I've seen people that spend every dollar that they have on psychics and on mediums and on general seances. Um, and these people that are doing these readings know that. They know that they do not have enough money. And this is what they do to survive, is to con these people into believing. It's a mixture of cold reading and um, a mixture of just guessing and Uh, When you're wrong, it's, you know, it's always about something else. I really think that um, it, it is a, it is a tragedy what they do. All right. You just made it. I'll (laughs) let you, let you have that one. (laughs) All right. Well, uh, you know, be sure to go out and vote. 
Oh yeah, to vote on this. Vote on this. You get me scared. Oh no, the <laughs> voting that stuff. The <laughs> that's done. The, remember, ghostly listeners, we know voting. Yeah. We do it all the time. Definitely. Go to ghostlypodcast dot com and you can vote your yeah. own. And we really want to hear your opinion on this one. Definitely. So I want to thank everyone so much for listening. Please share us with your friends and family as word of mouth is our best form of advertisement. Uh, We will be talking about the curse on the Kennedys on the next episode that comes out November 25th. We just can't get enough of this presidential history stuff. No, I love it. It's great. And definitely, you know, this was brought to us by a listener. And uh, man, it's such a good idea because... There's so much that went on in the Kennedy's family. So. Definitely. Um, and I did promise an update, right, on what's going on here. And um, so if you're if you're a listener and you don't want to, if yeah. you're you're this is a year from now, <laughs> yeah. and you know, there will be no more episode. This is just going to be an update on what's been going on with us and why we've missed the last few episodes. So absolutely, feel free to turn it off if you're not interested at this point yeah okay we'll see you later (laughs) so i wanted to apologize for our lack of episodes lately and i know that everyone's going to say that there's no need to apologize you know but i i feel like i do uh we were all set to do weekly episodes in october um but real life kind of has a way of derailing even your best intentions right Mm -hmm. um so i had a huge health scare I had some blood work done, and my doctor quickly called me and told me to go to the hospital. It seems my kidneys had failed me. And um, this is something that totally came out of nowhere. Um, It was something that happened within weeks. Right. It's not like you've been suffering for years or anything. This was just out of nowhere. It was just out of nowhere, yeah. And uh, when all the tests came back, they diagnosed me with a very rare disease. It's called uh, Good Pastor's Disease, uh, which is a horrible name for what I got. It should be like Nightmare Swamp. Yes, thing. Nightmare yeah. Swamp, I think, is uh, what I've decided. Yeah. yeah. Or maybe they could name it after me because it's so rare. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, basically, the antibodies in my plasma have been attacking and destroying my kidneys. And uh, nobody knows how or why I got this. Um it, it's just one of those things yeah. and it's made it really hard to do the research needed to push out these episodes because uh, I'm, I'm often tired, yeah. um, lack of energy. Um, you know, I don't feel necessarily bad. I just feel tired. Right. Which, you know, I just want to say, um, you know, that you're, you're getting treatment. We don't know what the path forward will exactly look like. So we don't want to make, you know, any yeah. whatever, you know, we'll we'll keep you updated as we go. Um, but I think the number one takeaway is to go to your doctor. Yes. I think that's why I you know, for us it's important to to bring this to listeners, no matter yeah. when you're listening to this. Um, you know, you felt tired. I How felt, many people feel tired? I felt tired. I was retaining a little bit of water. Mm-hmm. Um, hindsight now, probably a lot of bit of water. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and I, you know, was a little nauseous sometimes. Mm-hmm. But I mean, besides that, I was carrying on with my regular days. Right. Everything was fine. But you decided, you know what? I feel off enough yeah. that I'm going to go see my doctor. Yeah. And your doctor was um, smart enough to say... You know what? Let's do a physical yeah. because we don't know what this. We don't know what's going on. And I actually argued with him about that. Like, <laughs> oh, I don't need that. I just need something for the water retention. That's right, all. Right. You know. And uh, but he insisted on doing blood work with you, and that's how this all started. And yeah. I think it's something that we should all listen to. And it, it's hard right now too with um with COVID. Is is you know you with the Rona with the Rona. You know you're thinking I don't want to go to the doctor. I don't want to go to the hospital. But you know honestly, I think your experience seemed to be pretty safe. Lots of masks, lots of cleaning. Lot you got tested yeah. a lot of times, oh. you know, and um, you know it was a safe experience, and it like it saved your life. Definitely, it did. I mean, seriously, when you look at um, people that get undiagnosed with this, uh, it's pretty much a death sentence. Yeah, you know. But I do want to thank everyone that it, that has reached out to us, and all of those that have you know, kept us in your thoughts and prayers. 
And uh, we are very fortunate to have such an amazing listener base. And uh, I really feel that you're all our friends as well. Yeah. And I really appreciate that. And I can't tell you how much that that has helped me through this. Yeah. Ghostly is a great um, group. Yeah, definitely and, is. And a great motivator. Yes. I think for both of us. So. Yeah. And I couldn't wait to get back to doing this. We talked often about when we were going to record this episode. <laughs> and even in the hospital, I was, you know, doing research. I just wasn't tallying it up. I just wasn't writing a script out from it. Right, right. So, so I had ideas the whole time. And that was kind of frustrating, too, because I mm-hmm. kept changing my ideas of how I wanted to do this. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah. But that's that's it, and hopefully we're back to a regular pattern of every two weeks now. Well, um, we hope. Yeah, you we know, hope. just you know, we'll we'll keep your keep be if you're not on social media, make sure you are. Yeah, because we post on there. I prefer to do it on Ghostly Society more because it's more of a discussion than sure. I feel. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you're not a part of Ghostly Society, you know, now's the time. Yep. We have 360 people in there right now, which is doesn't seem like much, but it is a great group. It really is. And, you know, we've all gotten to know each other, and I really appreciate that. Absolutely. Until next time, stay ghostly. Bye.